Hello everyone and welcome back to the program. The very foundation of any stable civilization is the solid family structure. When that breaks down, you don't need a deep biblical understanding to know that something terrible will follow. As Time Magazine warned many years ago, no society has ever survived after its family life deteriorated. On today's program, we'll tell you the truth behind the moral crisis facing America and Britain today. The Trumpet Daily. I recently read a book about the political marriage between President Ronald Reagan and uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher back in the 1980s. And early on in this book, it talked about the, their upbringing. And they both came from uh, pretty different backgrounds. With uh, President Reagan, it wasn't so good. His, uh, his father struggled with alcoholism. Uh, and in the case of uh, Mrs. Thatcher, she, she grew up in a very strict and uh, religious household here in the Midlands, in the, uh, the UK. And uh, this book uh, says this, it's by Nicholas Wapshot. He says, despite their differences, speaking of Reagan and Thatcher, Despite their differences in circumstances, both Reagan and Thatcher were soon to arrive at an identical conclusion that the family, the primary building block of society, was the most important institution humanity had developed. Of course, it wasn't developed by humanity. It was established by God. These are God-ordained institutions, marriage and family. In any event, he says here, and that all other social units must be measured against the power and worth of this, the family that is, the simplest of units, two married parents bringing up their children at home. That's what they thought, these two leaders of the Western world back in the 1980s, about the traditional family. And you can read that today and think that, well, that seems so out of date so old-fashioned or so unimportant, and yet this very simple unit is fundamental to the establishment of a stable civilization or society. The traditional family unit, God ordained it, as I said. It's talked about in the early chapters of Genesis. It's really talked about all throughout this book, the Holy Bible, because God established the family. And he organized it from the beginning a certain way. And if we go to God for the instructions about how to make a marriage work, about how to bring up children in the way that they should go, it brings stability, not just to the home, stability and peace and love, but also to the community and to the nation. I mentioned uh, Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Reagan uh, in that quote. I just want to play for you now a clip from a speech that Mr. Reagan gave. It's a couple minutes long here. This is a speech he gave while running for re-election back in 1984. He gave this in a packed arena in Dallas, Texas in, uh, in August of 1984. Those who created our country, the founding fathers and mothers, understood that there is a divine order which transcends the human order. They saw the state, in fact, as a form of moral order and felt that the bedrock of moral order is religion. The Mayflower Compact began with the words, in the name of God, amen. The Declaration of Independence appeals to nature's God and the creator and the supreme judge of the world. Congress was given a chaplain and the oaths of office are oaths before God. James Madison in the Federalist Papers admitted that in the creation of our Republic, he perceived the hand of the Almighty. John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, warned that we must never forget the God from whom our blessings flow. George Washington referred to religion's profound and unsurpassed place in the heart of our nation quite directly in his farewell address in 1796. Seven years earlier, France had erected a government that was intended to be purely secular. This new government would be grounded on reason rather than the law of God. 
By 1796, the French Revolution had known the reign of terror. And Washington voiced reservations about the idea that there could be a wise po policy without a firm moral and religious foundation. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man call himself a patriot who would labor to subvert these finest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician and the pious man ought to respect and to cherish religion and morality. And he added, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. He rattled off quite a lot of history there about the founding of America, the establishment of this new nation back in the late 1700s. America's founders firmly believed that the bedrock of moral order, that it came from religion, they just took it for granted that marriage and family were bedrock institutions in early America. Notice what it says in uh, an article Paul Johnson wrote back in 1999. He said, both in Virginia and in New England to the north, the colonists were determined, God-fearing men, often in search of a religious toleration, denied them at home, who brought their families and were anxious to farm and establish permanent settlements. Thus took shape, he says, notice this, the economic dynamo that eventually became the United States, an experiment designed to establish the rule of God on earth. That's quite a noble experiment. And it was that, an experiment. It was designed to establish the rule of God on earth. God's law, the Ten Commandments, the basis of all righteous law. That's what those early founders of the United States believed. And that's why so many of them made statements like this one. George Washington, the foundations of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. President Reagan touched on some of these, these comments, these statements in that clip I played for you. This is John Adams. It's, it's religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. Now, it wasn't that long ago when a president in the United States agreed with those sentiments, agreed with those statements, just 30 years ago or so. But how many leaders in the United States or in Great Britain would believe something like this today? I mean, here in the UK, go back and look at some of the, the older, well, you don't even have to go back that far to look at the coronation ceremony and to see how much of that revolves around the Bible. All the more so, the further you go back, it'll be interesting to see how the next one proceeds. So much of it, though, revolves around the Holy Bible. Reverence for God's authoritative word. Whether it's in the founding of the United States or revolving around that throne here in the UK. You see the Bible running right through those early traditions. And how many people really hold that near and dear to them today? Back in 1999, this takes us back 16, 17 years ago, there was a, a conservative commentator who came out and basically said, look, he's a, he was from America, he says, look, we, uh, we've lost the culture war. Conservatism is, is basically dead, and we may get some Republicans in office. We, that still may happen, and it still does. But as far as the cultural dr uh, drift downward, that's gone to a point where we can't turn this around. This is what he had to say, Paul Weyrich. He's the one who went on to co-found the American uh, or Heritage Foundation. He said, the culture that we're living in becomes an ever wider sewer in truth, I think that we're caught up in a cultural collapse of historic proportions, a collapse so great that it simply overwhelms politics. I don't have all the answers or even all the questions, but I know 
that what we have been doing for 30 years hasn't worked, that while we have been fighting and winning in politics, our culture, our culture has decayed into something approaching barbarism. Something approaching barbarism. That's what he said back in 1999. And many among the conservatives, many within the Republican Party, really criticized him for that statement, saying that, well, it's, it's defeatist. It's pessimistic. We've got to fight on. And yet, look at where we are today. You have a leading Republican candidate for president in this current election cycle in the United States that earlier this year said, well, I'm a conservative, but at this point, who cares? Who cares? And that pretty much sums it up. What is there that's left to conserve, to hold on to, to keep it as it was? What is there to really get back to as far as the Constitution or the rule of law or traditional values or religion and morality? These things don't matter. I mean, we've got to fix the country, he said. And I'm not trying to make this into a political thing where one side's better than the other. I'm just trying to show you how far down we've gone morally. Isaiah chapter 1 has something to say about it. God speaking to our people today. He says in verse 3, The ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. This is talking about the, the latter day descendants of Israel. Those who ended up in primarily the United States and Britain. Herbert Armstrong talks about this in his book, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, here in verse 4. It says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They've forsaken the eternal. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. See, we're going backward. We're heading in the wrong direction. In the next couple of verses, it talks about a sickness that we have that goes from head to foot. A sickness from the, the top of our head down to the sole of our foot. And then in verse 9, it says, The show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They declare their sin as Sodom. And you can look back at Genesis 18 and see what happened to that society, Sodom and Gomorrah. God had a strong opinion. He had a strong view about their behavior. And they, they were corrected for it severely. And he says of these latter-day Israelites, look, you, you declare your sin as Sodom. You're proud. You're proud of this destruction of the traditional family, the breakdown in the family, the moral collapse. And God says in verse 10, Hear the word of the Eternal, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Hear God's word. That's what we need in the midst of this, this, this moral collapse of historic proportions. We need to hear God's voice. We need to heed God's warning. That's what God wants for us to do. We have a couple of booklets here, Character in Crisis. This uh, gives you some of those, uh, those quotes that we just had on the board there from George Washington and some of the American founders, and it demonstrates just how important it is for leaders to be principled individuals of character, God-fearing men, men that look to God, religion and morality. You don't see that so much today. And then this one we'll, we'll get into more in, this, in the next segment, The Missing Dimension in Sex. I'll bring a, a quote to you from, well, the early version of, uh, of this book that was printed back in 1964. We've only offered this once or twice before here in the UK. Make sure that you jot down the information that you need so that you can order both of these books, The Missing Dimension in Sex by Herbert Armstrong, and then this one here, a smaller booklet, Character in Crisis. We'll be right back. George Washington said, 
The foundations of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Character was no minor issue to America's first president. He regarded it as the basis of national policy. Where did the Founding Fathers develop these ideas? Many of these principles stemmed from the Holy Scriptures. The Bible provided early Americans with the instruction and guidance of how to properly govern one's life. These beliefs helped build a nation of strong families and upright leaders. Today, America has dismissed the Bible as the foundation of developing righteous character. Men now leave it to themselves to determine right from wrong. Where has the rejection of biblically-based principles led this nation? There is a cause for these effects. To understand the course of events that have led this nation to its current state, request our free booklet, Character in Crisis. In addition to this free book, also request Herbert W. Armstrong's superb textbook on dating, marriage and family, first written in 1964, The Missing Dimension in Sex. There is no cost or follow-up. Both Character in Crisis and The Missing Dimension in Sex are free upon request. The truth is, politics and morality are inseparable. And... And as morality's foundation is religion, religion and politics are necessarily related. We need religion as a guide. We need it because we are imperfect. And our government needs the church because only those humble enough to admit they're sinners can bring to democracy the tolerance it requires in order to survive. A state is nothing more than a reflection of its citizens. The more decent the citizens, the more decent the state. Once again, that's Ronald Reagan delivering a, a message in 1984, a message you certainly don't hear today, that politics and morality are inseparable. That's what he believed. That's what the founders believed. Who would use, though? Who would use religion as their guide? Well, that sort of thinking, those kinds of comments, particularly in the world of politics, they're denounced. They're mocked. They're ridiculed. Let me just play for you one, one last clip. This is from, again, Ronald Reagan's speech in August of 1984. Without God, there is no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. Without God, we're mired in the material, that flat world that tells us only what the senses perceive. Without God, there is a coarsening of the society. And without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. What a warning. Without God, he said, democracy cannot long endure. It, it, it won't work, this experiment. Without God, we can't do this. And he's just echoing what the founders believed, what the founders said on so many different occasions. Well, President Reagan came along and he was hopeful, he was optimistic that he could turn the ship around. He said this in another speech from that same year, 1984. He says, in the past few decades, many of us turned away from the enduring values, from faith, the work ethic, and the central importance of the family. We had something of a hedonistic heyday, he said. A hedonistic heyday. But it's passing. We've righted ourselves. And across the country, there's a rebirth of the traditional values that guided our fathers and mothers and guided our nation. Now, he was a very optimistic leader, and a lot of Americans loved him for that reason. But 30-some years on from that, we have to ask, was there really a spiritual awakening in the middle 1980s? Was there a spiritual rebirth? 
Was there a revival of sorts with respect to religion and morality? There were some that thought that was, that's what was happening. Another commentator at the time, Alan Carlson, a, a conservative commentator, he talked about the moral decline and, and blamed it largely on the, the churches and on the media and on education and, and social sciences. But then notice what he said. This is from a speech in early 1984. During the 60s and 70s, the defenders of property, family, and religious values were clearly on the defensive and even routed at times. But during the 80s, I'm pleased to report, that's no longer the case. During the 80s, it, it wasn't the case anymore. Just because of two leaders, President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, who came from more traditional backgrounds and who really did believe in the traditional family, they gave, in Reagan's case, as I just played for you, they gave some rousing speeches that really did support the traditional family role. But did it change our behavior in the United States or here in Britain? Well, I think you probably know the answer to that. Notice what Herbert Armstrong's uh, publication, The Plain Truth, was saying. At that same time, this is from an article in 1985, Gene uh, Hogberg wrote, the United States at the moment is experiencing an upsurge in national pride and confidence, but this is largely superficial, fueled primarily by economic optimism. You see, the economy was on the up and up, and in so many election cycles today, that's all that it boils down to, the economy. And, and of course, at that time, the United States was in the midst of a massive military buildup as well, so you can see why Americans were feeling better about themselves. But was there a really, really a moral awakening? In fact, the decay continued. And you look at where we are today. Really, it was only, there was just the lone voice of Herbert Armstrong in his magazine talking about what was happening in the 80s and before that, in the 1960s and 70s, and warning you about what was coming. Mr. Armstrong wrote a book back in 1964 called God Speaks Out on the New Morality. God has a strong position. God speaks out. God has something to say. That was the original version of this book here, The Missing Dimension in Sex. Mr. Armstrong and, and his team of scholars went to work on that book, God Speaks Out on the New Morality. It came out in 1964. And then it was changed to The Missing Dimension in Sex in the early 1970s. But I want to take you to a quote from that first version, 1964, where Mr. Armstrong says this, Where does Almighty God pin the guilt for this moral collapse? He pins it squarely on the world's clergy, the theologians, the priests, the rectors, the ministers, the preachers. They who ought to be society's moral leaders have forsaken the Creator God and have become society's followers. In that speech from Reagan, there was one point where he was practically begging the moral authorities the theologians, the preachers, to speak with one voice and to denounce the direction, the immoral direction of the nation back in the 60s and the 70s, and it continued on into the 80s. But so many of those preachers did not have anything to say. They went quiet, and instead of denouncing worldliness, instead of coming out of the world and the ways of the world, the ways of the world went right into those churches and they caved in. Let me read for you what it says in 1 Corinthians 6. Notice this strong language from the Apostle Paul. It says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's referring to homosexuality nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's all right there in two verses, packed into two verses. And yet there would be some in the 1980s, there would be plenty today that would say, oh, the Bible doesn't really have a strong position on any of these lifestyles. It sure does. It sure does. And where are the voices that are proclaiming this, this message? Well, it's in this book, The Missing Dimension in Sex. I just gave you the quote from the original version from 1964. 
There was Herbert Armstrong standing firm, grounded on the truth of God like a bedrock foundation. And everyone else just kind of caved into the pressure and went along with society. There's a passage over in 1 Timothy. I'll just have to read it on the board here. We're running out of time. But Paul says, he tells Timothy, look, you've got to be able to give them the truth. Preach the word, it says in verse 2. Be instant in season, out of season. In other words, be consistent. Stay with it. Don't buckle under the pressure. Keep at it. Keep giving them the truth. Keep telling them what God thinks. That's what we have to do before God. Otherwise, we're liars. We're not being honest as preachers. We've got to tell you what God says in His inspired Word. Preach the Word, Paul said to Timothy. Be instant. Stay the course. Verse 3 in this passage, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We're at that time. This world is just full of lust and vanity and all kinds of sins. All the sins listed in 1 Corinthians 6. Read Galatians 5 sometime. It's not like the Bible goes silent on these issues. It has a lot to say because it's God. It's God's voice. There's a verse in Isaiah 58 that talks about crying aloud and spare not. Declare to my people, God says, their sins. Show them where they're going wrong so that they can change their behavior. Well, this book here especially, both of them really, but this one will, will certainly give you the truth that you need. God's voice, it'll show you the way to go. It'll show you where you need to change when you're within your marriage and your family. The Missing Dimension in Sex by Herbert Armstrong. And then don't forget this little one here, Character in Crisis. We certainly are in the midst of a great crisis in character in our society today. Both of these we offer to you freely. No follow-up. So jot down the information. Call our operators today and we'll send them right out to you. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time. <music>